All right, Paul, so we've shown that neutron stars and these pulsars seem to be related to the centers of supernova remnants, at least in the case of the Crab Nebula. But we still have that first source, SCOX-1, which is this big, bright thing. It's not blinking at all like a pulsar. It's just really bright in X-rays. Maybe we need to look at that one a little more carefully and see what's going on there. Yes, there's a whole bunch of these X-ray sources that are not associated with supernova remnants that we can see. So what could be going on here? Well, to work this out, we first of all had to get better positions, knowing it's somewhere in that part of the sky isn't going to help us. So some experiments were done where they'd actually put obstacles in front of the X-ray detector. This, these patterns of grids would actually cast shadows in the background, it's like a, a collimator, and use that to work out more precisely where the X-rays were coming from. So if you had a lot of things, you would actually see the pattern, and th depending on where the pattern, the shadow was cast, you, know, the you could the tell the direction. Or that angle, yes. All right, because it wasn't very easy, especially back then, to make X-ray mirrors. Yeah. Although, interestingly enough, we can do it now. Yes, you have to have the, the X-rays bouncing off at a very glancing angle. Yep. And that was what later uh, missions had, but back then they didn't uh, have the capability to do that. But with things like this and with other various clever techniques, the pioneer X-ray astronomers were able to narrow down where some of these uh, X-ray sources were coming from. And it looked like ordinary stars. Ordinary stars? But how could an ordinary star produce lots of X-rays? That doesn't make sense in it at all. Yeah, we've talked about the sun that produced X-rays with flares, but th this is far too much energy for any conceivable flare to produce. So to yeah. my mind, that's telling us we're looking at binary here. That maybe there's a normal star and there's something much more exotic orbiting it, or it's all the stars orbiting the exotic thing. And when we see the normal star, we're not actually seeing where the X-rays are coming from. We're seeing something close to it, just like we had for the, the, the dwarf and classical novae. Okay. So we can test that idea. Yeah. But how are we going to test it? Um, well, the next clue came from the first X-ray astronomy satellite, Uhuru. Because up until then, people had kind of thought these things might be varying in brightness, but it's very hard. You launch a sounding rocket, you get a couple of minutes data, or maybe 10 minutes data, and then it comes down again. How do you know if it's really varying? So it'd be great if you could put an X-ray detector in space and leave it up there so it can sit up and look at the same thing for a long time and see if it's changing. And this is the first one that did it. And very early on, it was able to show that some of these compact X-ray sources really were pulsing. Mm. It's like pulsars in so X-rays. pulsing in the X-rays. Yes. Okay. Pulses for the first one was much slower than X-ray. Um, the radio pulses you get much further apart. Um, but there was more than that. The pulses weren't particularly regular. Sometimes the pulses would be closer together and sometimes they'd be further apart. Now that should sound like something we did in the last course about exoplanets. Right. So if they're closer together... So that would mean if I'm coming towards you, then the pulses would get pushed together. And then when I went away from you, you sort of get the Doppler effect to light. Yeah. When the, if I'm pulsing towards you and I'm moving towards you, the, the light from the first pulse or the X-rays from the first pulse sets off. But then if I move forward, by the time the next pulse comes, it's a bit closer together. So they're all going to be actually together. If I'm moving away, there'll be a bigger gap between each wave of pulses. Right. So it kind of looks like we've got a normal star. And we've got X-rays which are moving towards and away from us, and presumably sideways as well, but we can't measure that with this effect. So if this is going on, we would also expect the big normal star that we see to be moving around and showing Doppler effects as well. And eventually the optical telescopes got good enough to see this, and exactly the same thing was seen, that when the X-ray thing was moving towards us, the star was moving away from us, and vice versa. Again, very similar to what we talked about for the dwarf novae. So it seems like what we're talking about here is something like this. We have, similar to dwarf novae, a heavy thing, in this case a neutron star rather than right. a white dwarf. And we've got, in one of these cases, an eclipse was seen like this, and here it comes out. And we've got a, a star which is spilling gas through its Roche lobe in a stream onto this disk. Only now it's rather different because it's falling all the way down to the neutron star surface rather than a white dwarf surface. And because the neutron star has a big mass and is much smaller, there's a lot more energy to get out of that. So instead of emitting the ultraviolet light that they've got from the dwarf novae, this is coming out as X-rays. Right. And so we would have a huge amount of mass, a huge gravitational potential to give us the amazing amounts of energy and high temperatures that we need to explain this phenomenon. And this is also going to do rather strange things to the neutron star. Because you remember, this neutron star probably had a supernova a long time ago. We didn't see any supernova remnant around it. And so it should have slowed down. 
Well, we're going to get this, this gas and secretion just spinning around and falling down. That's going to speed it up again. Right, because you're going to conserve the angular momentum of the stuff again. And so you would expect these stars to be spinning, if they've been accreting for a long time, potentially very quickly.